and the panelists uh, switch on their videos um, because the next uh, several minutes, we almost have a half an hour really to just kind of talk about stuff. And I do have a few cases uh, if, if we need to. Uh, Jackie, are there any questions from the audience? And if not, then- I don't have any questions in the chat right now. Yeah, okay. Um, Fine. Um, and I think we have a poll. We have like two or three poll questions. Let me see if I can try those. Okay. Can you guys see the poll questions for limb optimization? No? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. So please go ahead. If everybody wants to uh, you know, take a look at these uh, couple of questions about uh, around limb optimization. And again, just to get a sense of what people's practice is like, even if you're a trainee or if you are a prosthetist, orthodist, uh, physical therapist. So the first question is about, you know, traumatic injuries. You know, how often do you see traumatic injuries in children in your practice, in your clinical environment? And then the second is about uh, what percentage is related to congenital limb differences. And I think, you know, in terms of traumatic injuries in children, I think uh, more than half of you have said um, that's about 50%, 0 to 25% of your practice, and about a third, um, 25 to 50%. So I, I think most of you do see trauma, but that's not the only thing you see. And then in terms of what percentage of your current practice is related to uh, care of limb differences, again, 70% said it's zero to 25%. So here are the shared results. So you can see those um, and soak it in while I stop sharing. Now share my screen. And I'll try opening up some cases for discussion. Um, okay. Um, but before I do that, let's just open it up to the panelists and especially the speakers from the section. Anybody wants to raise any issues, any clarifications? I mean, we heard a lot of great talks from all different environments, all different kind of practices. Um, so I'm just curious to see if people have any thoughts, afterthoughts, things you want to bring up. And if not, I'll, um, okay, I'm, I'm just going to, I have like three cases from my practice, uh, you know, over the last few years, which I thought are interesting and somewhat debatable. Um, so let me start by presenting the first one. Sanjeev, before you um, start, there is yeah. a, um, a question in the chat. Um, it asks, what about amputation stumps with skin grafts? Is there some new technology development to address this problem? Okay, perfect. Okay, anybody wants to take that? And again, it's uh, the discussion is open to other panelists, even those who didn't participate in this section. So please feel free to unmute, open your videos, and anybody can chime in. Um, Reggie, what's your experience with you know, amputation stumps with uh, skin graft. And maybe I'll ask our prosthetists in the group, both Mikhail and Matthew, uh, what's your thoughts? You're talking uh, traumatic amputations, uh, like we do like a guillotine amputation and then a, a skin graft or congenital uh, like when you decide, for example, to do a sinus amputation, and then there is a problem with the stump, and then you do a skin graft. Yeah, and I think, uh, personally, I feel like, and I don't know which way the speaker intended to ask the question, but let's, for the sake of argument, say it's for a traumatic injury. And we all know that kids will, you know, the skin grafts actually are better tolerated in kids than adults. But I think the question is, do they have more issues like you know we saw a case or two of you know free flaps for a foot amputation by dr morshed you know in other environments 
um, you know, where that's not available, you know, sometimes you could just do a skin graft and lay it on bone. And I've had anecdotal experience where, you know, it takes, the graft takes, it's not the greatest, it's not sensate, but, you know, it's better than what would happen in an adult. So I, th I think the question is, what about long-term if you have a skin graft and an amputation stump? Personally, I said, and completely agree with you, that they take the skin uh, graft, uh, a full thickness skin graft, the partial one really, uh, we almost never uh, do it. Uh, the one area that the graft uh, can have problems is at the oscalsis or the heel at the ankle. It's a very difficult uh, area. And even the plastic surgeon think twice before uh, going there. But on traumatic uh, injury, like we have lots of lawn mower injuries uh, here, where you get essentially a mangled uh, foot. And before thinking about an amputation, uh, you think about reconstruction. Uh, and even I have, we had here like at least two or three cases where you put your skin graft, you can put an external fixator of the elizar through the skin graft and then do your correction. And it works uh, very well. So yeah. I, yes, I would use the skin graft uh, and we are very happy with this whenever it's indicated. Okay. Anybody else wants to chime in? Mikhail, Matthew, or Peter? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would just say that um, the um, it, it's really dependent on the mobility of the underlying tissues below the graft. So if there is if the, the, the graft will probably be relatively immobile, but if the underlying tissues have mobility, that can prevent um, against what we're mostly concerned about, and that is shear forces which would ultimately break down the skin. Um, typically, we want to use a prosthetic interface with a relatively low coefficient of friction to prevent um, uh, prevent or minimize those shear forces, could, which could be like a P-light liner or a foam liner versus a, a more traditional silicone um, interface uh, with a high coefficient of friction. Those would be some considerations we would think of. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. OK. so. This was an eight-year-old uh, boy who presented uh, in my previous practice with a leg length difference. He had recently migrated uh, to North America about a year ago, didn't really speak much English yet, and um, was using a prosthesis when outside, didn't have pain, and at home he would either hop on the one leg or, um, let's see if I can advance this slide, okay. So these are his clinical pictures. And you could see he has a congenital shortening, primarily related to a congenitally short femur with a flexion deformity at the knee. But he's got a very functional, viable foot. And he sort of uses this bulky uh, prosthosis, if you will, um, for now. And uh, let's see the next slide. OK. I wonder if this video will play. Okay. And so these are the three ways he walks, right? So he can walk on his knee, he can hop on one leg, and he can use a prosthesis, a prosthosis. Okay, these are his x-rays. You know, he's got the classic proximal femoral deformity with the pseudoarthrosis in the subtrope area. His knee's not great. That's an X-ray with him and the prosthesis. These are some 3D things, uh, which is, you know, and his knee's not stable. I think his patella is dislocated and he's new to the country and the family is looking for something. So maybe I'll start, well, anybody can chime in. Questions or what do you want to know? How are you going to treat it? And I pick on Reggie since Reggie had brought this up. You know, what would you do in Montreal with this patient? Okay. So the first thing that uh, I would say in cases of PFFD, and uh, that comes really from uh, John Falsenberg, 
is that whether you want to decide to do a super hip illusion or whatever, look at the length of the pinhole stump. And if it is, if you don't think that you can do multiple lengthening for this pinhole stump, uh, then uh, the best approach would be a, a knee fusion and then a super hip if the hip is uh, fine. Uh, and then you convert really uh, to an about knee amputation. Whether you want to preserve the foot or another, that's another story. Um, what it looks, or another thing also that is a very, very important thing, and it's still it's very old. Uh, some of you will remember Bob Gillespie and one of his first articles, How to Treat the FFD. And he was saying that if the affected ankle joint is around the level of the knee, the contralateral knee, then this patient, this child, is not really a candidate for surgical reconstruction and multiple lensing, which is almost the case with this. So here, he seems that if he has a acetabulum, he seems that he has a femoral head, whether now the femoral neck there is a cerebral process or not, but I think that's a reconstructable uh, hip that you can do a super hip uh, procedure. And then the femoral stump that remains, it will be a knee fusion. And then you have one uh, segment, whole segment of the femur. And the ankle <coughs> uh, joint, in fact, you have three choices. Uh, you can do a, a vanness. Personally, I don't like the vanness. I have never done one. Maybe because of this, I have no experience. But in person, in the hands of someone who can know how to do them, obviously, it's a, it, it would be a perfect indication for a case like this, where you have, you mentioned, a normal foot and ankle. If you can have a plantar flexion of about 70, 80 degrees, again, it's a normal foot, perfect indication for a vanness. And you can do the vanness or your knee fusion um uh, same time. So the first option uh, is super hip, a knee fusion with a vanness and then a uh, about knee prosthesis. That would be the first thing. The second thing, even now with a long prosthesis, is functioning relatively well, but when he's growing, uh, it will be a non-functional way of working, 100%. So at small children, Yes, they tolerate these long braces very well. Their center of gravity is low, uh, but once they have grown up, it's not really an indication. So a few prosthetic fitting here, I would not uh, consider it. If the Vaness, some families refuse in Vaness, like especially in the Middle East or Far East, and especially in girls and women, they refuse the Vaness because of the psychological uh, effect. So then consider Either is on and, and the above. I think I talked a lot, but that's what I'm no, That's good. That's 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 good. And you know, I, I'll move on, but you know, I think other panelists can either raise hands or just talk. Um, but I, I sort of and again, just for disclosure purposes, Reggie hasn't seen this. So I'm I'm reassured. I kind of this is from the old days where I would uh, put down my in, operative plan on the printed x-rays and bring it to the OR. So I don't forget us, and I still think it's it's a good practice. So we kind of did that. The super event. Part of the problem was, you know, the kid was eight years old. The family really did not want the foot lost or sacrifice. And I think that's another problem, which I'm sure our prosthetists um, sort of, you know, I don't know that, that um, you know, people kind of don't want to get away, get rid of body parts after a few years of life. And, and so that, and that's a hard decision for families to make. So um, anyway, this is, you know, the usual technical issues. And he still has a pseudoarthrosis, he still has a bad knee. Um, and interestingly, I left that practice and then I got to know that um, someone who followed me in another institution ended up with exactly what you said, Reggie, not, not a Van Ness, but a knee fusion and a sign. And apparently the kid is happy right now. So I know we've got other speakers and prosthetists. So please, I know I'm talking a lot too, but I'd love to hear people's thoughts, experiences. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, as we're go ahead. And if not, I'm going to keep moving. And just to kind of reiterate, uh, oh, Mikhail has raised his hand. Mikhail, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering about because you just said knee fusion and and enzymes, but when he was walking with the author prosthesis, I thought uh, he had a Trendelenburg uh, gait. So there's in there is a uh, instability in the hip joint, and would you not do at a certain moment a hip fusion or so? Just in our situation of a lower middle income countries, we would we would really delay any kind of surgical uh, aspect because I mean he's going from A to B. Not not the not the best way here, but I think in our situation with little resources, we would kind of uh, stick with the orthoprosthesis for quite some time, and then as an adult later on, then the person will make his or her decision about that. And some of them, to be honest, they will just grab a pair of crutches and uh, move on with that. That's that's the reality. Here. Uh, yeah, that that that's but, a great point. So yeah, just uh, just for the audience too. So a super hip is actually a way to salvage the hip and to improve the gait and the Trendelenburg lurch, et cetera, by restoring the mechanics and the abductor momentum. So, so I think, and to have someone with a fused hip and sort of a fused knee would be a long peg. But you're right. I, I think that's certainly an option. Um, do others have experience? Miguel, do you have experience? What would you do in Venezuela? Hello, Carlos and G. Uh, in these cases, in these cases, in a, in a, in a place with uh, limited resources, uh, uh, an option could be to do a, a surgery, very old one, the steel. It's fusion. Uh, you have to fuse the the femur to the to the pelvis in a flexion. So we we can use the the knee as a hip, and the prosthesis is gonna work better. So I have some cases uh, that uh, the 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 parents don't want to do the sign amputations, and um, the prosthesis can work anyway. Uh, so that's a that's a good option for this patient. Uh, he's he's gonna use the prosthesis also, but it's gonna work better because all the weights gonna be on the knee that now is um is a hip, yeah. in but in the right direction. Fair enough. Okay, so um, just quickly, I'll go through a couple of cases just to sort of stir up some more controversy. So the and you know the other thing I want to open up for discussion is. When you have a kid with a congenitally severe shortening, you know, do you address, what do you address first? The hip, the knee, the foot, everything together, and what timing? So this is a good example. It's a three-year-old with primarily a PFFD-like situation with actually a good foot, but, you know, back to the psychosocial issue, the family didn't have the means or the stamina to go through multiple lengthenings, reconstruction, et cetera. So, um, and they'd gone through multiple opinions. So anyway, I actually, uh, when I saw him, you know, I, I actually sent him to another couple of families to talk to and ended up, and I hope uh, others are not cringing at this, but yes, we did a SIME amputation as a first stage realizing, and I think Matthew probably has seen this kid too, um, that, you know, he may need something else done, such as a knee and a hip. But I just wanted to get to know the family and to see what they were going to do. So long story short, just for the sake of time, he, he didn't feel very comfortable with um, the prosthesis that he had for obvious reasons. He has a bad hip. And he's, uh, you know, so, and, and he's got a flexion deformity at the knee. Um, and then it comes to, you know, what is the ideal stump length, et cetera. So after doing some calculations, we said, we're gonna ablate the distal femoral physis and fuse the knee and we did an arthrogram. And so this is where he is, I think a year ago and relatively happy with his prosthesis and Matthew can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and he's got a, you know, stable sort of stump to walk on. 
or, or to at least get a prosthesis fitted on. Um, and then we did a patelectomy as part of the knee fusion, uh, which is what's been recommended. And then, you know, I guess this is after hardware removal. So thoughts, criticisms, suggestions. Scott, Scott, Nelson. Hey, Scott. And then Peter. Uh, Scott, you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Thank Good to see you, Sanjeev. Thank you uh, for this case. I just wanted to pose a, more of a question about this case. I'm wondering how you decide to fuse the knee and then just allow motion to occur through that, uh, what we could call a hip joint, I guess, versus doing a brown procedure, uh, a brown rotation plasty where you'd fuse the femur to the pelvis and then use the knee for your motion. And how do you, or yourself or any of the other panelists, I'm interested to know what the advantages of doing this versus the brown rotation plasty would be. I'll just go first with a disclaimer that I don't have the skill set or the experience right now to kind of do a brown procedure, which, you know, um, you, you can maybe expand on it for the audience. But what I will say is here, my plan is to actually do a super hip when the proximal femur gets a little bit more ossified and to, to hopefully give him a relatively normal hip with good abductive function. But I just feel like right now, Family's gone through a lot, and I can always wait till the femur gets a little bigger and more ossified. But let, let's hear from Peter and then Chris. Yops. And by the way, we have about 10-ish minutes, uh, and then we'll have to close. Okay, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Peter. Uh, thanks, Sanjeev. I, th I think I, I want to raise the same question as Scott, really. That was, that was my issue. I've got a very similar case to this where I haven't operated on yet. Um, and that's that's the, the decision for me. And I think Dr. Galvin mentioned it, the, the steel or brown fusion of the femur to the, to the pelvis. I do hip fusions for other end stage uh, destroyed, destroyed hips, and it's not always easy. And in a congenital case that, that you've got such a, a short femur with little bone in a young child. You know, I'd, I'd really like to to hear if there are any tips and tricks on how to, how to achieve that because obviously the goal would be to have um, uh, a mobile segment, a, a mobile but stable segment. So basically getting a, the knee converted into the hip joint rather than an ischial bearing prosthesis with an unstable situation. At the, it would be great if you can salvage this with a, with a super hip later, but in my case, I don't think I can. So, you know, any thoughts that would be, I think it'd be useful to think about that. Okay, Chris and then Matthew, and then maybe Scott, because Scott, I think, has experience with, uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the other reconstructions. All right, go ahead, Chris, please. I just wanted to pose a philosophical question. I mean, with the increasing experience with osseo integration, I think some of our strategies are going to change in terms of how do we design a limb that's going to allow this patient to have an osseo integration implant to provide the best function? So some of our decision making might be influenced along those lines. So just just throwing that out there as a new new concept. Matthew, uh, if you want to also, can I pick on you to also then tell us where is because you have experience with osseo integration as well. You know where is it in terms of being used in kids. I know it's not, it, currently it's really just an adult technology for adult patients, but uh, please educate us and correct me if I'm wrong. Good. Yeah, you're not wrong. I mean, we're, certainly we're only implanting folks who are skeletally immature, but, um, you know, I think that perhaps maybe the question was, how do we set this child up for the future so that they can have an implant? And I, I think it's a, it's an interesting consideration. One, one um, contraindication for OI is for bone health. Um, and then we find that folks who aren't, kiddos who aren't loading um, their femoral segment, tibial segment, sufficiently through life have relatively poor bone development um, and quality. And in particular, the diameter of, of the tibia and femur are affected and and of course the implant has as a relative very specific diameter and length and so if that that, that could exclude them from being a candidate so we want to load these segments and just to the point earlier 
uh, what did, what to do with the hip. I, I, I can't say what to do surgically, but I can say anecdotally or from clinical experience is if you don't have a, a, pro, a stable proximal construct or a stable hip, um, these kiddos will always have a trigeliber gait um, for obvious reasons. Um, and so the, the goal f- from a biomechanical um, clinical perspective would be to, to be as stable as possible. I, I love the work that is being done at the Paleo Institute, um, the Brown procedure. I think that's really interesting. Um, and I think it would really improve a lot of these folks' gait. But just so you know what we load, so when a child loads a, uh, their affected limb in a case like this and in this pre- specific case, um, the child is actually sitting in the prosthesis and loading their ischial tuberosity. So there's limited long bone loading. And then of course, there's developmental um, impediment as a result. Thanks. Uh, and Scott, you're going to have the last word. Can you educate us on Brown procedure? I know you've had some experience and uh, can t- and tell us what would you have done for this kid? Um, yeah, I think in the situation, if the foot has already had a sign amputation, there's probably not a lot of benefit to the, all the extra effort required for the Brown procedure. And I've done a, a dozen or so Brown procedures, and it is a difficult procedure, and they don't all turn out with, uh, you know, a hundred percent with the results that you want. So I, you know, it's a uh, Still a open question in my mind, I think, um, how much benefit we get from doing something that has theoretical benefits like the Brown procedure, but maybe doesn't always turn out a lot better than the situation that this child has with uh, still somewhat of an unstable hip and uh, really looking at our results and seeing how these children walk with prostheses after Brown procedure versus after a procedure like this, which is actually a little bit easier on the child and probably on the surgeon as well. I yeah. think those are questions yet to be answered. And, and I tell you, I think our mindset is also changing, like in this day and age of patient reported outcome measures, that we are going to, we are starting to look beyond the x-rays, et cetera, and see what the patient and the family wants. And so I think that's full circle in terms of what Reggie said, that you got to keep the patient and the family in the mix to see what is their expectations and what are they seeking for. So I think it it just goes back to that. Um, Great, I think we're right on time. It's 8.45 uh, Pacific time. So we've got about a 14 minute break guys. And then we're gonna come back for another very exciting session on team building and setting up a limb reconstruction practice. So thank you so much for all participants, panelists, speakers. What a great session. Thank you.